In this tutorial, we're going to quickly look at how to add specular highlights to a scene, and we'll do this by extending the code from the diffuse lighting tutorial. To keep things as simple as possible, we're going to be a little bit sloppy with our code in several ways, and then we'll clean it up later. So to begin with, look on line 5, and you can see that we've imported information about a different model. So if we jump over to Buddha.h real quick, you can see that we still have those three variables, num indices, num vertices, and num normals. And you can also see that we have those three arrays, vertices, normals, and indices. So let's go back here to main. We'll drop down just a bit. Now, another early change that you can see is that we have a couple of different variables in lines 49 and 50. Specifically, we have cam x, cam y, and cam z, as well as yaw, pitch, and roll. And these variables are going to be used to hold the position and orientation of the camera. Now realize that this is not normally how we would do that. Typically, you would store that information in a matrix. But in this case, we're going to use those variables to move that camera around just a little bit. You can see that we use those variables in this keyboard function. And that function begins here on line 148. Now this is a callback function that Glut's going to be aware of. And I'll show you that code a little bit later on. But if you look on the inside, you can see that we switch on the key that was pressed. Now if they press the Escape key, which is that 033, or the Q key, the program's going to exit. Otherwise, if it's W, A, S, or D, we're going to change the position of the camera just a little bit. Similarly, if they press the E or R keys, we're going to change the Y rotation of the camera just a little bit. All right, good. So let's drop down to the render function. And these lines are where we're setting the rotations and the translations of the camera. Notice that in line 186, we're putting that information into the variable V, which is then passed off to the shader in line 190. So let's go ahead and jump over to the vertex shader. And you can see it's really similar to last time, except on line 16, we've declared another out variable called FE. And this is going to represent the vector between the camera and the pixel in the scene. Now, if you jump down to line 23, you can see that we've calculated the value of this variable by taking the position of the vertex and multiplying it by both the model matrix and view matrix. And because it's an out variable, it's interpolated for all the pixels that need to be rendered. And just to reiterate, remember, this is going to represent the relationship between the pixel and the camera. All right, so let's go ahead and jump over to the fragment shader. And if you look, you can see that this information is coming in in line 6, and then we actually use it in lines 14 and 15. So in the previous tutorial, we calculated those variables n and l in lines 11 and 12, and we're going to do a similar thing in lines 14 and 15. In line 14, we reverse the direction of that vector Fe just to make the math work out. And then in line 15, we calculate the half vector. And if you've forgotten what the half vector is, that's the one that's halfway between the view vector and the light vector. All right, good. Now, in line 18, we still calculate the diffuse intensity just like we did last time. But notice that in line 19, we're using that intensity and multiplying it by an actual color. So in this case, the color is 0.1 for red, 0.8 for green, and 0.1 for blue. In other words, the diffuse color is going to be a mostly green color. Now, if you drop down to line 23, this is where we're going to calculate the specular component of the lighting equation. Now, the math behind this has already been explained, but notice that we're taking the dot product between n and h, and then we're taking the max of that dot product with 0, because remember, dot products can return negative values. Finally, we're taking all of that stuff and we're raising it to the 30th power. Now, we'll toy around with other values later, but notice this is going to return us the specular intensity. We then use that specular intensity in line 24 by multiplying it by a color. And in this case, the specular color is going to be 0.7 for red, 0.9 for green, and 0.7 for blue. And then finally, since I've already calculated the diffuse component and the specular component, I add those two things together in line 27 to generate the final color. Now to prove a point, I'll change the specular color from this light green to red. You can see that the diffuse color is still green, but the specular color is yellow because red plus green equals yellow. So I'll go ahead and shut this down. Now to make the specular highlights a little bit more noticeable, let me change that back. And then I'll come up here and I'll change the diffuse color. And in this case, you can see that the diffuse color is actually a really dark gray. So if I were to run it now, you can see that we get something that looks almost metallic. All right, so I'll shut this down. I could also go back in and change the specular highlight color. 
back to red, and if I were to run it again, you can see we get a different effect. It's pretty cool stuff. So let me shut this down. All right, good. So let's come back and look at line 23 again. You can see that we currently have the power raised to 30, but let's change that down to something like 3. And if I were to run it, you can see it still looks metallic, but the specular highlight is massive. All right. Now, if we were to change this 3 to something like 200 and run it, you can see that the specular highlights are smaller, which makes the surface look harder. All right, so we'll set this back to 30 and then jump back over to main.cpp. Now, one last thing that you might want to do just to play around is to uncomment this line 195. Now, if you do this, it's going to render it in wireframe. So let's go ahead and run that. And the reason that I wanted to show you this was so that you could see the color interpolation between the vertices. All right. So let's go ahead and change that back. And then the last thing that I'll do is I'll restrict it so that it doesn't actually rotate, commenting out line 169. Now let me go ahead and run it. Now what I want you to notice here is that as I move the camera, the specular highlights change position. So you can see, especially on that curvy section on the bottom, you can see that the specular highlight moves left and right as I move the camera. So that's it. Hopefully you can see that adding specular highlights contributes a lot to the quality of the scene, and it only takes a couple of lines of code.